Broadcasting from the Unshackled Studios in Melbourne, this is Wilms Front, brought to you by theunshackled.net. Now here's Tim Wilms. Now obviously what uh, people will be most uh, interested in hearing first is that uh, oh, it was during your birthday you were on trial, your appeal trial at the, the County Court of uh, Victoria for uh, your blasphemy uh, conviction as I call it. If you look up the actual definition of blasphemy and what is in section 25.2 of the Racial and Religious Tolerance Act which you were c convicted under in, in 2017, it does fit the definition of, of blasphemy and it stems from during your United Patriots run activism against the application and approval process for the Bendigo Mosque uh, to promote a rally, uh, you, Neil Erickson, Christopher Shortus, headed a mock dummy outside the Bendigo City Council building and uploaded it to Facebook and the dummy had mock blood uh, coming out of it and basically, well I, I was in there for all four days of court that the reason you are the only person prosecuted under this because the the video was so because it, it as the section says it caused revulsion uh, ridicule and contempt the video that's what is being put forward by the prosecution by the state government prosecution yeah and the attorney general's office as well actually because basically, because I actually hadn't seen the, the full video because it's not just the beheading stunt there. It is, it, it is also, it's got marching afterwards, apparently marching, that's also sinister uh, as well. You with Australian, Australian flags and you can, I, I said to you at the time that you can understand how the 2015 normie uh, might be scared, intimidated or or threatened by that even though that was not your intention because you were convicted along with Neil Erickson or you were the only one convicted Neil Erickson and Christopher Shortus got $2,000 fine so did you but that it was your intent to create this video and that's what the the prosecution has to prove uh, the, it, it was my intent to through the video incite serious contempt revulsion or severe ridicule of muslim people that's what they're trying to prove and that's what the uh what the trial consisted of the trial that began on my birthday and for the few days after as well went for a few days after and you uh took the stand you or you were represented by a patriot lawyer john bolton he was the well, your sole legal representative there were there were t two from the victorian director of public prosecutions office mm. and then there was three from the attorney general's department two two barristers and then for those who don't know there's there's a barrister and then there's a solicitor who sits opposite and sort of does does notes so there, there was five versus one yeah so the situation there is five government lawyers barristers and solicitors from both the department of public prosecutions of victoria and uh, the Attorney General's office, if you don't know, the Attorney General is basically the government's highest ranking law expert against little old me and my barrister, John Bolton. And that's how it played out. Now, obviously it took, you were convicted in September, 2017. The trial took place in November, 2019. That was, it was supposed to take place in August, uh, but the, the judge who was going to hear that case, Judge Lisa Hannon, she received a promotion to chief magistrate of the Victorian Magistrates Court. So the judge presiding over the case was Chief Judge uh, Peter Kidd, who everyone knows who he is because he was the one who presided over George Pell's two trials and the eventual jury guilty verdict and sentenced him to, to six years uh, in prison. And obviously Chief Judge, that means there's a lot of judges in the County Court of Victoria, but he's the the, the head one there. Yeah. Um, I thought overall he was, he, he had a, my impression, open mind. He was, he was basically very, uh, I, I would, uh, uh, he, he gave a lot of time to uh, both uh, John Bolton and uh, the, the opposing counsel basically to uh, explore their, uh, propose their, their arguments and 
Uh, he, he never was hostile, I felt, sort of once. When you're a judge, it's your job to be unbiased and, you know, objective. You're supposed to hear the facts and mm. you're supposed to come to a finding based on the facts. So at the very least, as a judge, you've got to pretend to be unbiased and patient. It doesn't necessarily mean you are unbiased and patient. Uh, but I didn't have a problem with the judge throughout the, throughout the trial with uh, Chief Judge of the County Court, Peter Kidd. However, I believe it's unlikely that you, be you become Chief Judge of the County Court without rubbing shoulders with some, you know, high-ranking bureaucrats in political offices. And that doesn't make me very comfortable that he'll find uh, or make a, a finding that's beneficial for me. But uh, I, the only problem I had with him, there wasn't any major problem, as I said, but the only issue I took was when I was in the witness box on the second day, uh, answering questions put to me by the state prosecutor and my own barrister, he wasn't really happy for me to be expanding too much on details regarding my political activity, my upbringing, and what led me into politics and what ultimately led up to the mock beheading and the protest against the mosque development in Bendigo. He kind of reprimanded John and me in that process and asked me to be more succinct, which I don't think he should have done. It's probably in his interests to know the full story of my political activity in making his finding, but that's what he chose to do at the end of the day. That's the only real issue I took with his his presiding over my trial. The way that I saw it, it's <laughs> when you're on the witness stand, it's not, a, it's not meant to be a soapbox. No, no, but I still think that my engagement in politics and my interest in it, what led me to be engaged in it, is all very relevant to my alleged offending, or what the government alleges is my offending. So I don't think he should have stopped me from explaining my political activity in, in, in the witness box, but he chose to, so I had to. So. But uh, you were cross-examined as well by the, the state prosecutor, and it, it seemed the strategy was trying to, to get you to admit that you wanted to cause offence to, to Muslims. And it was... I was actually surprised it wasn't really touched upon the trial that, because you're accused of vilifying a class of people, but not all Muslims practice beheading. Mm. Obviously, the, the 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 Arab countries governed by by Sharia law they practice uh, beheading, but it's certainly not a shared a universal Muslim value. Sure. Uh, well, after I was questioned by the state prosecutor, uh, she asked the judge to basically not believe anything I said and that nothing I said matters. What does that mean? It means that everything I said in the witness box works against their effort to prosecute me. It means I did well for myself. Mm. Basically, the prosecution is always going to accuse you of lying mm. when they ask you that questions in the witness box. That word was never used though, which I found interesting. Yeah, because it might be a strong uh, accusation to make that this person's lying. She said I was being evasive and therefore nothing that I said matters. And their argument is that in the video of the mock beheading itself, of us cutting the head off a dummy made out of pillows and fake blood spilling out of it, in that video itself, there's enough evidence for this judge to find that I am guilty of inciting serious contempt, revulsion, or severe ridicule, and that nothing I say about my political activity, my political beliefs, my political motivations, my understanding of Islam, nothing I say matters, that I'm guilty no matter what I say. And that was the argument made by the state prosecutor, and it wasn't challenged by the Attorney General's office. Well, I felt that the role of the Attorney General's office there was to both uphold the Racial and Religious Tolerance Act as being consistent with the Victorian Charter of Human Rights and Responsibility and the Australian Constitutional Implied Freedom to Political Communication, which we all learned is not an individual right, it's a restraint on legislative power. And it seems to me that the, the State Attorney General wasn't... Uh, concerned with your guilt or not just upholding the legislation and we heard about the background about why Racial and Religious Tolerance Act was was necessary that's because we needed to protect multicultural Australia because that's how Australia is and what I found fascinating is that restricting your political communication your right to free speech actually enhances political communication and free speech because your video it could have intimidated muslims from participating in the political process that's the the argument put forward yeah i found that fascinating as well it's an interesting way to put it 
there isn't any evidence that any Muslims have been excluded from political communication as a result of me speaking or demonstrating. Actually, there's every bit of evidence that suggests the opposite. Muslims uh, in the Bendigo area actually disguised my political activity in the area as a blessing in disguise because they met a lot of friends in government and media which helped them to get their mosque project built and helped them to get plenty of money from the government. So realistically, the Muslims should probably be in court thanking me and saying that, let maybe saying, let this guy go because the result of his polit polit political activity has only benefited us because the government's more sympathetic to us now. But as I said, like their claim that my, demonstra my demonstrations and my speech is ostracizing alienating and removing muslims from political communication is subjective and based on their own opinion there's no evidence that suggests that that's taken place i mean let's have a look at uh, 2019 you're banned from mainstream media but has any muslim exactly been banned yeah. from well there you go it's it's so often the case uh with my engagement in politics that everything i'm accused of doing i'm actually the victim of myself i'm accused of being racist or you know being discriminatory but it feels as though that the state government and its bureaucrats have an issue with my race the race that i belong to uh, i'm accused of you know basically uh, removing muslims from political communication or making it harder for them to engage in political process or even society because of my activism when in reality every effort has been made by large corporations state government media to disclude me and censor me from, uh, or, you know, basically disqualify me from taking place in political process and political communication. So it's all a big projection, I think. Everything I'm accused of doing, the government and the media is actually doing to us. You've yeah. often been accused of, on, well, formerly Twitter and, and now Gab, yeah. of engaging in conspiracy theories about the the prosecution that you face but to my way of thinking it's basically this is what the law is designed to do it's it's not it's not a conspiracy it's we saw we saw it in court that we do not have free speech in australia and mm. if free sp uh, free speech is it's supposed to be designed to have equal uh, participation in in public life that's the the judge is basically we don't know his decision yet but he's got to apply the law as is or how the high court through various court cases has as it's interpreted. been interpreted as it's been interpreted he doesn't apply the law as it is he applies the law in this case as he is choosing to interpret it based on other interpretations made by high court judges so the law is a very interpretable thing it's never really that solid until it's been used a number of times by a series of judges and therefore it's taken on a certain form and can be referred to you know through various reference points in this case the argument of the state prosecution and the attorney general's office is that australians have no right to free speech that anybody can be censored jailed disqualified from engaging in political communication so long as political communication as a whole is not affected in this country so as long as censoring or even locking up an individual doesn't affect politics in australia generally speaking then it's all okay and that's what the prosecution and the attorney general's office labor government is proposing to this judge and that's what they would like the judge to make a ruling on they would like the judge to make a finding in their favor on that well they they, they also argued that oh, this is the only speech you've been prosecuted for you've been able to say lots of other things on facebook and and twitter of course you're not there anymore but that was that was their position you're still free to say what you want yeah which is not true and they had to pull back once do you remember when uh they tried to suggest that the police closing businesses or encouraging local businesses in bendigo to close before one of our rallies and then blaming it on us and saying that we were guilty of economic terrorism so we actually held our rally after that in Rosalind Park in Bendigo, so they couldn't do that to us again. Uh, the prosecution was asking me questions in relation to that, trying to suggest that that negative attention from the police was a result of the mock beheading video. But all of that happened before the mock beheading video. It happened um, before our first ever rally in Bendigo, before we had even become active in politics. So we were on the end of uh, a great deal of hostility from local police local media local government agencies 
from the minute we even talked about setting foot in Bendigo. You know, so she pulled back on that very quickly because it probably, if I answered those questions or if she harped on on that point, it would have indicated the opposite of what she was trying to put across, that actually we were the ones that were on the end of the hostility and not the poor innocent Muslims in Bendigo. Yeah. Well, the, the Bendigo faithful, as they're known, they came to, to court to support you. They've come to not just yours, but uh, other local patriots who've been at, been at court and they were the because it was alleged at the time that you were just blow-ins but you were invited there and four years later those bendigo activists against the the construction loss they're still there they're still making their voices heard and they've managed to or we, we don't know that the mosque only broke ground this year uh, a few months ago i think in in june when daniel andrews put the shovel in the ground and gave four hundred thousand dollars of victorian taxpayers money yeah i wonder if daniel andrews ended up with calluses on his hands after putting that shovel into the ground it's probably the first time he's ever picked up a shovel in his life daniel andrews if you don't know is the victorian state premier you know, from the illustrious political class you know m m probably a lot of working class people wouldn't even know his name but uh yeah i find it funny that uh, the state government had to end up funding this mosque and making it very public that they were funding the mosque mosque because you know uh, the whole counter protest saga against us was based on this perception that we were all uh fascists in league with the state and the police uh, racists that were secretly friends with the police and state government and now you turn around and the state government is giving $400,000 to the Muslim community, taking me to court for offending the Muslim community, censoring me. I think it's a result of state government pressure on social media companies from posting anything on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, uh, closing my bank account, preventing me from having a PayPal account. So I really don't think anybody, any sensible person could seriously believe that there's some sort of relationship between the quote unquote right wing in Australia and the government realistically there's every indication to believe that the, the the other side of politics is receiving all the assistance they they need from government media corporations and academic bureaucrats of all sorts now didn't you say that uh, during the uh, the the leftist protest against that mining conference one of the local police did the the okay sign so that shows well Tom oh, that, 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 that proves that all police are fascists well you know? <laughs> they, they, they wanted a inquiry into racism in the victoria police based on the one of them doing the okay sign and another one had over his thing uh aed which stands for eat a dick hippie <laughs> well i think a lot of individual police officers probably have good moral standards depending on his rank though he might be sacked if he's of high enough rank then he'll maintain his job but see what happens well, it's really it's just an individual case they mentioned your bank account being shut first it was you because you solicited donations from your supporters first via PayPal. Your PayPal was shut down then directly to your Westpac bank account. And then that was shut down in June, they said, for commercial reasons. And we're not going to tell you about our commercial uh, imperatives, which uh, you would have seen in the news this week. Westpac has been uh, under investigation by the financial transaction watchdog. And they facilitated, was it 23 million illegal transactions, including ones... Uh, which were uh, for child pornography in the in the Philippines, and uh, which basically they, it seems to me that they closed your account because their basic understanding was, oh, we better shut down anyone's account who might be involved in or um, controversial activity. I don't know. Uh, I heard that the reason they intended to close my bank account from the beginning was a number of shareholders for MasterCard were Marxists or involved in Marxist groups. And they had been putting pressure on Westpac for a long time, but Westpac basically had been ignoring them. But then uh, it's possible that they caught wind of the fact that maybe they were going to be in trouble for something else. And so they thought they might try to appease these people, these you know members of political class and bureaucratic elites and soften the blow that was coming by banning some extreme right-wing figures using their services. I don't know why it was done. They didn't tell me. So yeah. well, It was also A and Z. They 
And they went further, just not even prominent nationalist figures, just supporters who maybe had memberships or loose associations with various nationalist groups. They got their bank accounts uh, closed as well. Uh, yeah, I heard ANZ was the worst offender, mm. but I'm really not sure. Like, I, I made a comment about it when I started to realize that it wasn't just people active in politics whose bank accounts were being closed, but known associates and family members as well. Mm. People who might be able to support those people who had already had their bank accounts closed. That's when I thought it was newsworthy, but obviously mainstream media journalists and editors don't agree with me on that fact because they haven't reported a single case of a person losing a bank account because of their political views. Well, they, there, there was some mainstream media coverage of uh, sex workers getting their, their bank account uh, closed. That was uh, reported as uh, discrimination. Yeah, but not in this case because it's... Uh, nasty white males getting mm. their bank accounts closed so that's okay yeah, yeah. I, I just raised that because obviously patriots getting their bank account shut that's what's well, political discrimination mm. and but there's no outrage about that but apparently these sex workers getting their bank account closed that's a that's a huge outrage no the pre-programmed outrage mob only gets outraged about things that they're you know they've been told they can be outraged about you know <laughs> But it's interesting that, well, we we have, it's basically a banking, well, there's four big banks now. Hmm. It was NAB, Westpac, Commonwealth Bank, ANZ. And of course, the, the banks, well, they have a banking license, but they also have a lot of privileges. And well, banking is an essential service. You use your card every day, most of the time, or every business now has the the tap and go and the the federal government they're now looking at banning cash transactions over ten thousand they already have it. i thought they already had it's mm. it's well, it's it's, it's going to pass it hasn't hasn't come into yeah. uh, effect yet that's supposedly cracked down on uh, uh illicit activity but this is the point that i come down to it's basically they they want to break you that's what that's that's what they want to do by basically making Try, trying to close every type of way that you every, can live a normal life. Every type of free interaction and transactions. So everything you do is digital, computerized, and can be cancelled, essentially. But that's not going to achieve much in the long run. It's just going to push You can't legally make money and purchase things legally because it's made impossible for you. Then people will just start robbing and stealing. So I really don't know what they intend to do with that. I'm not really worried. I mean, I don't. I can support myself regardless of what they do to me, and I've always said that from the start. Like, but it's it doesn't have any sort of, in my view, any long term beneficial effect for them, for this current political class and government if they're going to uh, financially asphyxi asphyxiate and you know strangulate people political dissonance to the extent where they can't participate in society legally they'll just do it illegally then they'll just become criminals maybe that's what they want so they can just call all right-wing people or conservative people criminals but i don't know like it, it's going to be interesting to see where it goes but <laughs> but it shows obviously the given what we know about westpac this week and obviously they shut down your bank account because they wanted to uh, show that they were tolerant and believe in social justice and of course all the banks they support support it same-sex marriage i think a lot of them support indigenous recognition in the constitution or what it, yeah, what it is now yeah. uh voice to, voice to parliament mm. uh but and of course I, I remember you posted this out on gab that these corporations that basically tricked who 10 years ago were the the people who hated the corporations mm. that basically tricked these people into to loving them even though while well, they're doing all this virtue signaling stuff of course we've just seen well there was a banking royal commission before that they've been behaving appallingly yeah well i for lack of a better term it's just so gay i'm sorry to say it, but it's just gay like why would you be afraid of a bunch of people screaming at you and the, the, the real problem is what these corporations don't understand. I don't know whether they're linked into a big network that tells them what they have to do or not. If, if they're caving to the demands of hysterical Marxists really is just the result of Marxist hysteria, what they don't understand these corporations is when they give an inch to these Marxists, calling them racist and sexist and homophobic and whatnot, 
then the Marxists go harder. They take a mile to see how completely they can bring these corporations under their full control. It's like a shark sensing blood in the water. When you start to try to appease these people even just a little bit, they come at you harder, a hundred times harder, until they've got you completely by the balls. Because that's what they do. They search for weakness. They hunt for weakness. If they can't find weakness, they'll try to create it by lying and creating all of this mendacious language to make you guilty and fear in fear of something. So Marxism, communism, all of these social justice warriors, they're bottom feeders. They look for weakness. They create weakness. They search for weakness. And then they exploit weakness. And if all these corporations have to do is simply say, fuck off. And nothing would happen to them. If they did that from the start, if this country from the start just looked at communism and said, fuck off, and continuously was vigilant about the different forms of communism, the different subversive programs that communism was using to infiltrate this country, if they could easily identify them and just say, fuck off, fuck off, fuck off, then this country would be fine still to this day. But as a result of weakness, we're in the position we're in right now. Well, a perfect example of what you've just described is is Facebook. They banned you, Neil Erickson, Ricky Turner, Tom Saul, that you can't even look at Facebook now, even without a an account. You're permanently disabled from it if yeah, you try yeah. to create a... And obviously, Facebook, they have this dangerous individuals policy, and Australian Meditation's Facebook page was deleted for posting a photo of you and Neil Erickson outside of court. But as we've seen today, or over the weekend, uh, Sasha Baron Cohen, well, he's made a living basically of, well, he would say, oh, comedy, but it's basically slander against people he doesn't like. Yeah. He was getting a Lifetime Achievement Award from the, the Anti-Defamation League, which is a, a Jewish lobby group yeah, in the United no, no, no. States. Yeah. And he said that uh, Facebook is basically being the biggest propaganda machine of all time because, well, Mark Zuckerberg, he was before the US Congress, about a month ago, and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, the, the Democratic Socialist, uh, said, oh, you're not taking down uh, ads, uh, uh, political ads, which are uh, misleading, which basically... Basically means any political ad that isn't socialist. Yes, yeah. but uh, Sasha Baron Cohen said that uh, Facebook, uh, they were... It, Joseph Goebbels would have loved it, and uh, yeah. uh, Hitler would have been able to advertise the final solution uh, yeah, on, sure, yeah, on sure. Facebook. And this yeah. is the thing: Facebook's they banned all of you, but they still haven't won because they're wanting more, the, more, and more. Yes. And the Guardian even did. I was just reading uh, today; they did a big expose on all the the white nationalists who are still allowed on on yeah. Facebook. Well, they've gotten results by complaining and sucking and lying. And because they've gotten results, because Facebook's rolled over a little bit and showed some weakness, as I said, now they're going in for the kill. Now they know they can get more results if they keep complaining and lying more. So that's just what it goes to show what I was just, you know, an example of what I was talking about. And I liked Mark Zuckerberg yeah. saying, oh, we can't ban these political ads because of free speech. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I was... Uh, a colleague of mine was just banned or limited in some way for posting a photo of me. And the reason, he was given a reason, the photo of me, according to Facebook, violates Facebook's community standards on dangerous individuals. Yeah? So I'm really, yeah, that's really, that really sounds believable when Sasha Baron Cohen, if that's how you say it, says that Facebook would have allowed Hitler to advertise the genocide of Jews if he paid enough. But they won't allow a photograph of me because I'm a dangerous individual. It really adds up, doesn't it? It's just ridiculous what these Hollywood elites say and, 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 and accuse people of. It's, it's usually the opposite of what's true. Like uh, one, one more thing on that. Sasha Baron Cohen specifically said, I, I read his statement. He said that Facebook was interfering in the electoral process, right? Basically by allowing a diverse amount of information to free flow through people's computers, through people's fields of vision, by giving access to free information from various different sources, rather than just one source of mainstream media or various different labels all essentially representing one source, that was undermining democracy somehow. So what that means is, this: what this Hollywood elitist is basically saying is that democracy only works when people are only told one thing from one source of news. But when you're getting lots of different information from lots of different sources of news, that's not democracy, that's election interference and anti-Semitism. That's what he said. In, in, in effect, he just said, 
the opposite of what is the truth. Well, they also still haven't given Facebook for allowing Cambridge Analytica to be hired by the Trump and Brexit campaign yeah. because I watched a documentary on it, it was called The Great Hack, and it's basically that the their hypothesis is, is that the public were stupid and they believed all the, the fake things that uh, Trump and the Brexit campaign uh, were, were saying, and this is, there, there needs to be, the, and they were able to, to get away with it. I, there, there is legitimate privacy concerns about it because of the third party sharing of information, but the main hypothesis is, is that uh, oh, all this information was getting out without a filter. Yeah, I don't know. What, what kind of filter? Who's going to determine? Yeah. Like, it's just, I don't know. Well, they shouldn't have created it. They shouldn't have let it happen in the first place. If these big globalist bureaucrats and, you know, your illustrious bankers and people who control the political narrative, who pick presidents, destroy presidents, control the media, tell uh, media bosses what they have to report, if they wanted to maintain their grip on global control, they shouldn't have allowed Facebook in the first place. So, you know, it's their own fault. <laughs> yes. Now, obviously, the appeal process has taken two years from the original trial in September 2017, and it's fair to, or we will never know the exact reason that your appeal, you're the only one who was found guilty who decided to appeal, so your PayPal bank account closed, Facebook deleted, and obviously you've had to... Well, pay legal expenses, you had to have time off work because courts, they, they sit Monday to, to Friday. Yeah, and they basically don't give a fuck about you. Yes. Like, that's, that's the way courts operate. And so my question is, was was this all worth it? Because you heard the, the arguments in, in court yeah. that th they made a pretty convincing case that the law is, Racial and Religious Tolerance Act is not constitutional, and it is... It is not violating the Victorian Charter of uh, Human Rights and Responsibilities. And so the only w only positive result that could come for you is your conviction gets overturned. I don't think that's the only positive result. Like, you don't know what's going to happen. It's probably unlikely that I'll get any victory just because we're up against the state's best lawyers. And it's five lawyers and solicitors, the Attorney General's office, against John Bolton and myself. Uh, it was just way too much resources pumped in by the state government to try to get this law upheld. Uh, but you don't know what's going to happen. It might it might all be worth it at the end of the day. But if, regardless of ha the amount of money I spent, the amount of my time that was used, I promised people I would take it all the way to the end. I said after the magistrate's hearing that I was going to appeal to county because county, county court judges, in my experience, they do a better job. They're in the county court rather than magistrates because they're dealing with serious issues. They're dealing with homicides they're dealing with you know burglaries they're dealing with serious crime all of the time and so they they're sending people to jail for long periods county court judges the higher you go in court supreme and high court above county court the more likely you are to get a a, a better finding a more reasonable and fair finding and so i never intended to wear the magistrate's conviction from the beginning and uh just as i said i told people i'd take it all the way to the end and that's what i did the, obviously, the tricky, trickiest thing for them to, well, they, you're found guilty in the magistrate's court, but because the law says that you had to intend to incite this revulsion, ridicule, and severe contempt, that, and that's what your cross-examination was about, trying to basically psychoanalyze you. Yeah, that's, at, yeah, that's what the conviction's about. That's important for everyone watching this to understand. Like, I have not been accused of committing any thri crime through conduct. The well, it is a criminal, uh, it's the only criminal provision in the Act, that's yeah. section 25-2. Yeah, the conduct I was engaged in, like pretend, like a pretend dummy, like we're pretending to behead it with fake blood, it's not the conduct itself that's been deemed criminal, but it's my intent. It's why I was doing that, that they're trying to make a crime. They're trying to go inside my head and say, he was trying, he was doing this, he was doing this protest, this demonstration, because he wanted to go out there and vilify, ridicule, revulsion, all those words they used, Muslim people. And that's all that was in his head. And the video that we're showing you here, Your Honor, Mr. Judge, proves that regardless of anything he says. Everything he said, don't listen to him. Believe us, he's guilty of a thought crime. That's essentially their argument. 
And it's interesting yeah. that a few months prior, Fiona Patton, who's the uh, Reason Party, formerly Sex Party, uh, MLC, she's proposing the Racial and Religious Tolerance Amendment Act, which will expand because it's just about racial and religious vilification. She wants to extend it to include sexual orientation, gender identity, and disability, and she wants to remove the intent uh, requirement that it just has to in they, they, they just have to prove in future prosecutions or cases that it was capable of causing all of these ridiculous... which goes a step further again yes which yeah. which because obviously the reason i asked you that that's the tricky point because if this was under this amendment they wouldn't yeah. need to prove the and this year, under the amendment if it was passed and it probably will be passed they always get what they want these bureaucrats we are uh, working classes too disengaged from politics and too busy but uh that means that they can charge anyone with vilifying a specific group of people regardless of intent regardless of conduct if they say you're guilty you basically don't have any way to defend yourself they can say for this reason this reason and this reason what this person said on facebook could potentially have caused other people to become offended therefore he's guilty of a criminal offense and the judge basically has to find you guilty if that legislation is passed yeah. well if the trial is concluded uh chief judge peter kidd is reserved his judgment because well as you saw he's got well probably about 12 cases high court cases to read which yeah. if you're listening closely like they go to paragraph 300 so He's got a lot of um, uh, homework, but he told us uh, he'd be ready in weeks, not days. So we'll await to, or your, your lawyer, John Bolton, will get notified, and obviously you'll get notified. And then uh, obviously it'll appear in the, the, the court list. And yeah, we'll. Well, hopefully we get notified. We weren't notified of a lot of things throughout this process. Hopefully we're told the date. <laughs> but yeah, we'll see what happens then. Thanks for tuning in to Wilmsfront. Visit timwilms.com or Rational Rise TV to view the archive of episodes. And keep visiting theunshackled.net to view all our shows and to keep up with the latest real news and analysis.